and welcome to one-to-one -one mining investment APAC online. Today we have Ian Roper, General Manager at Shanghai Metals Market Singapore, to talk about China's economic response to COVID recovery and the outlook for metals supply and demand. Well, thank you to one to one for inviting me to run through all our commodity views today. Um, so clearly, you know, title of the presentation at the moment, macro momentum continuing to lift most metal prices. I think that's been very clear the last few months. Generally, metals have done well, uh, macro, you know, weaker dollar, money printing, a global economic recovery, clearly helping things along. Um, but it's very clear to us that supply is now responding, given those higher prices. So metals prices, yeah, they continue to rise through the third quarter. And like I said, combination of uh, the global macro story there and especially weaker dollar kind of bringing more money into the space and, and certainly bidding up a lot of the LME metals. Um, interestingly though, commodities which don't have a huge paper trading influence such as manganese, alumina and the coals are much weaker than those that do. Now, I I'd still say manganese, alumina and the coals do have very weak supply and demand fundamentals, so it's quite justifiable that those prices should be lower, but that is, is just does stand out as a bit of an uh, interesting fact. So one of the big issues that got metal prices moving in the second quarter and one of the reasons we were quite bullish on, on the kind of post-China lockdown recovery was the supply disruption. You know, across the board, we saw things like iron ore, copper heavily disrupted um, due to the virus issues um, through the second quarter. But it's quite clear since then that a lot of the mining supply globally is starting to increment. In uh, iron ore, for example, Brazilian exports are running up 150 million tons annualized from their lows in the second quarter, while in copper, you know, disruption in Chile and Peru no longer seems to be getting worse. And at some point we'd expect volumes from there to start turning higher as well. <coughs> Sorry. When we turn our attention more to the smelting side, we're also seeing strong increases in uh, Chinese smelter output, especially over August there, with those high prices and margin incentives for things like uh, aluminium, and copper, zinc. Uh, we've seen increasing production for all of those. In fact, aluminium production finally exceeded its 2017 highs to make new highs for, for the first time. So fundamentally, our, our main issue with the market at the moment is that expectations towards demand are just too elevated going into the rest of the year. So I'm not bearish on the demand outlook. I'm just saying sequentially from here, you know, China is already running extremely strongly and we don't see substantial further upside in Chinese demand. And yes, ex-China, we are going to see recovery as the world's moving out of lockdowns and, and economic activities resuming. Um, but still, I would say that ex-China demand recovery is not going to be strong enough to absorb the supply increases that we are seeing. So one of the reasons I'm more cautious on the Chinese demand outlook is the government messaging more recently. So since uh, Chinese New Year, since the lockdown period, since the MPC meetings, they had a very supportive economic message. They're very clearly wanting to support growth, um, messaging that they'll do what it takes, print enough money, get the activity recovering strongly so that there's no unemployment problem. And now we've very much seen that happening. So their messaging on the 30th of July on the back of the latest Politburo meeting was very clearly that they're happy with growth. There is no longer an unemployment problem to worry about and therefore they no longer need to provide as much support to the economy. So that wasn't really a shift to tightening, but it was very clearly a message that loosening is finished. There won't be any more loosening here. So focusing again on things like reforms, quality of growth, et cetera, that's just going to, uh, to mean, you know, bring back some of those structural headwinds and uh, less stimulus going forward. So when we look across the data, you know, what's been going on, obviously more recently, we've had a very strong recovery in some of the consumer driven things, um, home appliances, et cetera. And that's obviously benefiting from a resurgence of export volume and autos as well, very weak with a lot of the auto plants closed through the first quarter. Uh, but since then, auto production last couple of months has been running up double digit levels. Whereas when we look at the property side of things, you know, the property market's very solid, um, but you know, low to mid single growth, digit growth in property, certainly no way near double digit growth. So yeah, as I said, autos recovered very well, power grid investment, that's been something that was doing well through the second quarter as well. 
So one of the other reasons to be a bit more cautious into the back end of the year is that we are now in the last few months of the current five year plan. And we, we did see in 2010 and especially in 2015, those last few months of the five year planning cycle, we clearly did see growth slowing down um, as they hit a lot of the targets and kind of eased back into the, to the end of the plan. So the discussions around the next five year plans will start in October. So we will start to see headlines coming out around those. It's going to be interesting how the markets interpret those headlines, because on paper, there will be much lower targets across the board, much lower GDP target. It's likely that rail budget, grid budget, etc., will be reduced as well, because from an international level, Beijing has, has largely uh, you know, done a lot of the backbone networks. There's not so much need for that national state central plan infrastructure. However, we're more positive on the five year demand outlook across the board because of the decentralization of the economic growth targets, right? As we've seen this year with stimulus, stimulus was all about special bond issuance by Beijing and then distributing that money to the local provinces to execute projects at a local level. So no longer so centrally planned as it used to be in the, in the old days, they are kind of trusting the local provinces and cities to manage their growth themselves. So just essentially send them the funding, uh, but allow the execution at a more local level. So that will very much continue. We'll see plenty of talk about satellite towns, things like New Chang'an in Beijing, you know, whole new cities um, on the outskirts of tier one, tier two cities. Things like more rental housing, land swaps, upgrading old buildings, build out of urban metro systems, etc. So yes, on paper, China's demographics are a lot more challenging in the 2020s, but overall we don't really see that the demand for the commodities, steel, et cetera, are really gonna decline that substantially, certainly in the early 2020s. We think there is still enough good news stories, even as a headline urbanization, headline demographics worsen than the, this whole upgrade cycle and improving urban livelihoods will still be very supportive to growth. So if we move on now to, to the metals themselves, um, so obviously metal prices, as I said, doing very well on the uh, global macro optimism. Um, copper, absolutely still the standout. That is the only metal today where we still see very low inventory, very tight raw materials, and a you know, clear tightness across the board there. But even in copper, you know, the supply disruption is no longer really getting worse. Uh, Chile, Peru, if anything, look like they're getting on top of the virus restriction issues. Mines there may start to produce more into the end of the year. Equally, the higher prices in China are incentivizing a bit more scrap generation as you'd expect. Um, on alumina, that, that's a commodity which, which sticks very tightly to its cost curve. We've seen numerous mini price cycles there. We continue to believe that fair price for alumina is around $250 to $270. So we're gonna to continue to fluctuate around that. And in aluminium, the prices for aluminium obviously did exceptionally well through the second quarter, but that has given smelters huge margin incentive to increase production. And finally, we have started to see that. Remember, there is no structural shortage of uh, capacity through the aluminium chain. We have plentiful bauxite supply, especially with all the imports coming in. We have plentiful alumina refining supply in China, and we have plentiful aluminium smelter capacity as well. So we don't see any structural tightness through the supply chain. And therefore, you know, we do believe aluminium prices at current levels are probably unsustainable. Zinc as well, that's done very well, obviously leveraged into the infrastructure demand recovery, auto recovery especially, um, but we, you know, again, we don't see that demand sequentially going much higher than it already is, whereas on the supply side, supply is clearly coming back, both at the smelter level and also at the mine level with TCs especially starting to increase. So as I said, copper prices, you know, they're at two year highs now, they've been doing very well recently. Physical premiums certainly led the way. There's clear physical tightness in the copper market. It's not just a paper driven move. Clearly we are very short of copper units in China, especially that tightness has been driven at the raw material end. So about a one third of global mine supply has been disrupted this year with the virus issues and that's caused the TCs to drop to extremely low levels. Um, and then on the scrap side of things, you know, China was supposed to reclassify there are scrap imports and allow in the high quality scrap unrestricted from July the 1st, but China Customs postponed that regulation change, not quite happy with the paperwork yet. So that change to those scrap import regulations has been delayed. And that's obviously just gonna keep the scrap import market in China 
very tight for the foreseeable future. Onshore, however, we have seen the scrap generation increasing in, uh, in, in recent months due to the high prices, just a bit more collection and scrap generation with that margin incentive. At the same time, the smelters, when we look at the smelter production here, so a lot of smelters, it's a similar story in zinc, where margins are very weak in the second quarter. So a lot of the smelters pull forward their maintenance schedules for the year. As we've now come out of those maintenance schedules, prices and margins are obviously much more attractive. We're now seeing the smelters increase production. So we're seeing that as a story across the board in the, in, in the base metals in China and copper very clearly there. A big jump in August production. We expect that to continue in September. So yes, the uh, inventory of copper is still at very low levels on LME, Chinese bonded warehouses, Chinese visible inventory as well. Certainly we have very low inventory across the board that should continue to support prices. But as I said, supply is now increasing for copper onshore. So you know, we don't think the market sequentially is going to get tighter than it already is. But you know, the copper price may continue to go higher if global macro trends, weak dollar, money printing, you know, all those kind of stories that have been assisting money flowing into the copper space in recent months. If they continue, there's no reason copper can't continue to, to rise in the short term. In the medium term, of course, the copper uh, structural story is only strengthened by what we've seen this year. You know, the fact that we've had so many mine disruptions, uh, that we've, mines are high grading, not doing enough maintenance, and no one's been working on expansion projects and a number of the mines as well. So that leads us to cut our future supply growth expectations versus what we were looking at previously. And that just means that the medium longer term outlook for copper, obviously much stronger on the back of that reduced supply expectation. So copper remains very much the favorite metal in the medium long term. We still think it's leveraged to all the good demand sectors, things like EVs, building up charging infrastructure, renewable energy, 5G grid build out, uh, ongoing urbanization, build out of urban transit systems in China, etc. So we still believe uh, copper has, has the best long term fundamentals uh, and equally in the short term, it is still the one commodity that looks reasonably tight today. Whereas when we look at zinc, zinc's clearly a bit weaker than copper right now. We have seen mine supply lifting up recently uh, and mining TCs as a result have increased. And as with copper, the smelters pulled forward maintenance in the second quarter. We're now coming out of those maintenance schedules and smelters are starting to lift production. Now, the difference between zinc and copper mainly in our view is that the, uh, the zinc inventory is just not so low. So zinc demand has done extremely well in recent months. The strong recovery in auto production, restocking by galvanizers, restocking by auto companies with that, that strong auto recovery. Um, yeah, demand has been great, but it hasn't drawn inventory to extremely low levels. There is still clearly quite a bit of zinc in the system. And now smelters are starting to lift production that makes us a bit more cautious on the zinc price. We just don't see it being as tight as copper here. So therefore a bit more downside risk to zinc prices in the near term. On aluminium, you know, aluminium, we saw SHFE Ali massively leading the LME prices higher um, as China was drawing inventory and smelters had kind of cut production with low margins at the end of the first quarter. But that huge import price um, spread for onshore versus offshore aluminium has led to a surge in ingot imports for the first time since the 2008-9 financial crisis. So we were saying last couple of months, the strong onshore price for aluminium will support LME prices because China is starting to export a lot less aluminium and import a lot more ingot. And that's exactly what's been happening. Now, however, the Chinese smelters have finally managed to start lifting production given those high margin incentives over the last couple of months. So aluminium production in August rose to a record high. It's gonna continue rising in the months ahead as the new smelters ramp up capacity. And we've already seen the aluminium inventory starting to rise. We've seen the spread over the LME again, turning negative, going back to its traditional level with China as an exporter. So, you know, LME aluminium has now lost that support of Chinese ingot imports and therefore we think SHFE prices will continue to move lower. We also think LME prices now will be moving lower as well as the Chinese supply continues to lift. When we move to alumina, 
that did see a bit of excitement on the kind of aluminium smelter output lifts uh, that carried the alumina prices to recover from all the way up to near $300. But the problem is the Chinese cost curve for alumina is extremely flat, around $250 to $270. So as with aluminium smelters, the alumina refineries as well have responded to those higher margins and lifted production in the last couple of months. That's meant, you know, even with the high import supply, um, that the import supply may be at risk next couple of months without Norte um, closing some of their production. Uh, but overall, we think there is enough alumina supply onshore that that's not going to tighten up the market. We still continue to believe alumina prices should be fluctuating around a 250, 270 target level. At the same time, bauxite supply very clearly very strong on the imports. Uh, a lot of bauxite this year continuing to come out of Guinea and elsewhere. That's just been pressuring prices lower and onshore as well. There's just no tightness in the bauxite supply. Prices have been pretty flat all year. So if we just shift from the, those key base metals onto the battery materials, um, certainly the, the battery material space has been getting a lot of attention recently. There's governments globally looking to push a green recovery story. Uh, EV sales obviously lifting very strongly in Europe recently. Uh, a lot of uh, commitments from governments to spend more on charging infrastructure, build out subsidies, etc. So the whole EV space has been getting a lot of attention recently. And the number one beneficiary seems to have been nickel. Um, now, it does feel somewhat like we are in the second half of 2017 with that whole EV euphoria because we do not see any fundamental tightness in the nickel market today to justify the pricing action that we have seen. So obviously when we look at the stainless side within China, stainless markets have been pretty weak through the second half of last year. They have recovered more recently, demand's been improving, but still stainless inventories are still at very high levels. They haven't been drawn that strongly. And the problem when we look at nickel unit supply is all of the MPI flooding out of Indonesia at the moment. So with the, the nickel ore export ban in Indonesia, that's just led the investors there to accelerate the ramp ups and expansions of all the MPI capacity there. So Indonesia now running at 600,000 annualized MPI exports. And we believe by the end of next year, we now expect total Indo MPI capacity to reach 840,000 tonnes. Now the entire MPI market, Indo and China combined, last year was less than a million tonnes. And we are now expecting Indonesia alone to have 840,000 tonnes of capacity by the end of next year. So that means that China just does not need so much MPI capacity domestically. So we know that a lot of bullish people trying to push the story of nickel ore supply constraints are gonna cause nickel prices to go higher. We're just not seeing that. Certainly there's been a draw of the nickel ore inventory at the ports, but that actually ended in May. Philippines supply has been recovering strongly since their lockdown. Obviously rainy season now disrupting it a little bit, but you know, we don't see a real nickel ore shortage versus China's reduced MPI production requirements. You know, China does not need to produce as much MPI now because it is taking more and more out of Indonesia and that will continue. At the same time, when we look at class one nickel, the class one nickel production onshore has been increasing strongly in recent months and, and last couple of years as well. Nickel sulfate production is running up double digits this year. Um, other class one nickel production is also strongly increasing. So when we net that all back, the problem the nickel market has at the moment is China is not chasing class one nickel imports. And this is the big difference from nickel versus other commodities. Copper, zinc, aluminium, steel, China has been sucking in all of the imports with the weak ex-China demand, strong onshore demand. We've seen price arbs, we've seen material flooding into China accordingly. But in class one nickel, we have not seen that. So yes, China is buying all the MPI, but China is not chasing class one nickel imports because it's just producing a lot more itself and it just doesn't need it yet. So that begs the question, where is the class one nickel going? Because you know, globally, nickel demand has to be suffering with you know, exposure to sectors like aerospace, oil and gas engineering, etc. But nickel supply globally didn't see the same degree of disruption as we did from the virus in, in, in other metals, especially. So you know, we do expect nickel globally is in surplus this year to the tune of 80 to 100,000 tonne excess. But the question is, where is that metal going? Because we're not seeing it on the LME and we're not seeing it going to China. So intuitively, it feels like the nickel market should be oversupplied, but visibly 
you know, a lot of question marks, where is the material going? So are there hidden inventories building ahead of the EV story? Um, people trying to drive that story. Um, but you know, to us, it just doesn't quite add up. We don't see the fundamental time is in the vehicle market to justify these prices. Um, and given that apparent global oversupply, we should really see nickel prices correcting very soon. Uh, looking at the other battery materials, equally, they don't look um, very tight either. So lithium and cobalt prices, we've been saying since the end of last year, we don't think things will get worse. We think we've had all the bad news in terms of the weak sales numbers, the Chinese subsidy removals. We expect this year for sales and the headlines to show some improvement but we're less optimistic on the actual underlying prices. So the problem we have in lithium, China's adding a lot of hydroxide processing capacity this year. Utilization rates are very, very low for those guys. That's why the price spread to carbonate has come down a lot. Um, and equally in cobalt, there's still plentiful supply, even with China building a little bit of a strategic stockpile there in recent months. So yes, sales are recovering strongly. A lot of subsidies globally, especially in Europe for EVs. Uh, equally in China, city by city subsidies, as well as national level subsidies. And we still have a very optimistic outlook on the structural EV story. Absolutely, you know, we're very positive on the 2020 growth story for the next decade. But, you know, that growth has been pushed out now versus where we were at the start of the year, given the weaker sales for the first half of the year. And consequently, we don't see lithium or cobalt in deficit now until 2023 there is clearly just too much supply. So yes, prices are at very low levels. We have seen a lot of supply for lithium and cobalt taken offline recently. We don't think things will get worse, but equally we just don't see any fundamental tightness there. There is still enough supply in the pipeline on the sidelines, which will come back in to meet the demand growth for the next couple of years. So yes, beyond that, it's a great structural story, but we just can't get too bullish on the lithium and cobalt prices on a one to two year view here. So just changing focus a bit onto the, uh, the ferrous side of things. Um, iron ore prices obviously have done exceptionally well in recent months, but to be honest, we can't see the fundamental justification to support that. There's clearly some uh, you know, very odd moves going on in iron ore when we look at all the premium and discounts for the various products. Um, so when we look at steel, you know, our view on, on, on steel, we were certainly expecting a very strong demand recovery in the second quarter, but we turned more cautious in June because by that point, demand had already recovered very strongly. And we were saying sequentially from here, we expect to see demand come off seasonally during rainy season. And then equally for the second half, there's generally no structural strength to construction activity. Equally by June, the feedback we were getting from construction companies is they were already running at 110% because of Beijing's urgency to support growth, urgency to get things done, property developers feeling confident as well. So activity levels in the second quarter, we're already viewing at 110%. Now, obviously since then, we have seen a good recovery in consumer driven things, autos, export businesses. That's why kind of HRCs outpaced rebar in recent months, but equally demand there now at very high levels sequentially. We don't expect much improvement into the back end of the year. At the same time, we're clearly not seeing any post rainy season recovery yet. The trading activity remains very subdued. Mills have started to trim output given low margins and high steel inventories as well. We're just not seeing the steel inventory draw, certainly the way the, the more optimistic market was expecting. And steel prices and margins, of course, prices have done well, but steel mills are not making any money. It's gone straight through to the raw materials. Um, so margins, very low levels. The reason for that is of course the surge in Chinese steel imports. So last year, China was a net steel exporter of 50 million tons, but for the last three months, we've been seeing China as a net steel importer of around 10 million tons annualized. So that's a huge swing on China's production base for steel. It's about 6% of steel production in terms of that swing from a net exporter to a net importer. So when we add that to the domestic production growth, up kind of six to 8%, um, that implies apparent steel demand is running up 14% year on year at the moment. Now, absolutely, we believe demand in China is very solid, but we don't believe it is a double digit demand environment here. So clearly that high steel inventory, weak steel margins, all do suggest the steel market is a bit oversupplied. So yes, China sucking in all the steel imports has been great for ex-China steel producers. It's lifted global steel prices, but you know, we just think that 
there is just a bit too much steel supply in China. And as the demand sequentially is not going to improve here, prices and margins should come under further pressure. So when we turn to iron ore, of course, iron ore prices have continued to soar the last couple of months, but the premiums are all completely out of line. Lump and pellet premiums have collapsed. Lump premiums are even negative at one point, which makes no sense given there's around an 18, 20 cents VIU for using lump over fines, given that you save the sintering process. Equally, the grade premiums are all out of line. You know, high grade premiums collapsed in, uh, in early August as well. So the reason for that is just that 62% benchmark material. There has been a little bit less supply of that at the Chinese ports, and that is very tightly held by a number of traders who clearly were helping to create some artificial tightness in the market by refusing to sell their inventory and just trying to squeeze that 62% market and take advantage of, of higher prices. Because um, on paper, there is no structural shortage of iron ore. You know, obviously imports have done extremely well this year, even with the disruption to supply out of places like Brazil. There's also an extra 20 million tons of iron ore in port queues today, given the bad weather that we've had in recent weeks, port queues building domestic iron ore supply as well, increasing strongly in recent months. So supply availability of iron ore on paper is, is plentiful today. Uh, as I said, domestic supply clearly lifting, port inventory bottomed out a couple of months ago. That's come down again with that, that uh, kind of disruption to the unloading. But as the unloading increases, we do expect port inventory to be rising through the rest of the year. At the same time, seaborne iron ore supply is lifting very strongly. We've got initially confidence on that from the high freight rates, clearly miners booking more ships, and we have now seen Brazilian export volumes recovering very strongly in recent weeks. So Brazilian export volumes earlier in the year, March, April lows, were sub 5 million tonnes a week, whereas Brazil recently has been running at an 8 million tonne a week level. So that's 150 million annualized supply growth. Of course, supply has been a bit reduced July and August with the Australian miners, a lot of them doing maintenance. Uh, but as those maintenance schedules conclude, you know, it's traditionally Q4 tends to see very strong shipment levels with the weather being, being calmer. So uh, we do expect iron ore supply to be flooding in in the months ahead. You know, the, in 2Q, seaborne ore supply was running 250 million tonnes below capacity. And that's why we were saying iron ore prices should be above $100. But right now, sequentially, we don't expect steel demand to do much better than it already is. Uh, globally, of course, we are seeing recovery, places like Europe, etc., but not so much in Asia. India, Japan, still not showing much sign of recovery in those markets, um, whereas the iron ore supply is clearly lifting. And with oil prices where they are as well, you know, we don't see much cost support for iron ore above $80 here. So when it corrects, it will correct sharply. And we think back to that 80 odd dollar level before the end of the year. Um, so just wrapping up on some of the other ferrous materials, met coal, manganese. We see met coal is the one commodity where we see the price still well below cost, stuck down at $110 for the last few months. But yes, the Chinese onshore market is extremely tight. The problem is with all the import restrictions around coal, the Chinese buyers, steel mills just cannot close those import arms. We don't expect that situation to change anytime soon. So the Met coal market really is just focused on recovery in ex-China steel markets. Europe, we're starting to see furnaces coming on, but certainly not yet in Japan. And in India, the biggest buyer of Met coal last year, uh, clearly the virus situation worse than there. So the Indian steel industry has clearly benefited from more steel exports to China, but domestically, the demand doesn't look like it's going to be coming back strongly anytime soon. And therefore, we don't expect Met coal prices to be recovering in the short term. That said, when we look at next year, if global steel demand is anywhere near normalized, Met coal does have significant upside from current levels. It's the only commodity where we can see it higher than today uh, for next year. Manganese, meanwhile, you know, manganese prices have clearly given back those gains we saw initially around the South Africa lockdown excitement, kind of March, April, that got manganese prices moving. We did see port inventory starting to draw from very high levels through the second quarter. But since then, manganese supply has actually been somewhat stronger than expected. Port inventory has been rising and prices have therefore moved lower. So again, we don't see any good news coming up in manganese. Clearly, the demand is very good. It's just there is plentiful supply there to meet that demand, uh, very minimal disruption at the end of the day out of South Africa, Brazil as well. Supply just seems to be moving along quite comfortably.
So that's it for me. Um, that's the overview of, of the metals. Um, so thank you very much for listening. And if you do have any questions, please uh, feel free to get in touch. My contact details on the screen there. Thank you very much.